Hi, everybody. Um, uh, good, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you might be. Um, uh, my name is Vic Gupta. I am an engineering VP at, at Google. Um, I, I work in the geo department. And um, I'm extremely pleased uh, to welcome my good friend, um, Dan Zygmunt, who is the author um, of this awesome book called Buddha's Office. Um, Dan, um, as some of you may know, uh, is uh, uh, a, a Zoogler. Um, he worked at Google for, for many years on a variety of uh, projects and uh, most recently was a leader at Facebook and Instagram. Um, Dan is the author of several books um, and this is his latest, uh, his latest uh, effort. Dan, welcome. Really good to see you. Thank you. So great to be here. Thanks for uh, having me. So Dan, do you want to tell us how, um, how we might be using the time today? Yeah, so I thought I would start by just reading a little bit from uh, from my book, uh, just to give people a sense of, of what it's like. I'll just read from the introduction, and then we can jump into questions, and I'd love to answer any questions you have or, or anyone else has about uh, work, Zen, meditation, anything. Great, great. Well, I, I think you and I have been having a conversation about your books for a while, so I do have a list of questions which I'm going to which I'm gonna go through, and then um, hopefully folks can use the, uh, the features within the YouTube stream to post any questions they have as well. And I'm looking forward to having a lively discussion. Yeah. Well, why don't I just jump in? Like I said, right. I'm going to read from the introduction, uh, which is called Waking Up at Work. Buddha never worked a day in his life. He was born about 2,500 years ago, grew up a pampered prince in ancient India, left those riches behind to become a wandering monk, and ended his life as a revered spiritual teacher, all without ever earning a salary. It's not clear that he even ever handled money and he forbade his closest followers from doing so. So why would anyone wanna know what a freeloader like that had to say about work? Let's start by backing up a bit. A few people today still follow the Buddha's literal example and renounce worldly possessions, leaving, leading their lives as full-time monastics. In fact, probably more do than you think. Estimates range from a few hundred thousand to a million or more worldwide. But if you're reading this book or watching this stream, I'll bet you're not one of them. You've not chosen to spend your life cloistered in a temple or monastery, let alone wandering the rural countryside of some far off land without a fixed address. Neither have I. For better or worse, most of us today do not live as Buddha and his core disciples did. One way or the other, most of us spend much of our adult lives working. Some of us basically hate it. It's a rare treat these days to find anyone who truly loves their work. Too many are working long hours at jobs they can't stand. The lucky ones look forward to the weekend when they can have two days of their real life back. But many in high stress careers don't even do that, grinding through their Saturdays and Sundays, barely slowing their pace, charging towards some hoped for retirement or other future reward. Most Americans don't even take all the vacation they're allowed. Those lucky few who do love their jobs often have their own frustrations. Maybe it's nonstop stress or lack of resources or miserable behavior by colleagues or clients. Or maybe work is fine, but you just wish there was a little less of it. It seems that everyone with a demanding career laments their work-life balance. Does anyone really enjoy answering emails and texts at all hours? And all of us who are racing and striving like this may be in for a surprise. A study in 2016 found that work-related stress was the fifth largest cause of death in the United States. Some of us not, might not make it to retirement at all. It doesn't have to be this way. And Buddha knew this 2,500 years ago without ever setting foot in an office. When Buddha had his great awakening, when he literally became the Buddha, which means the awakened one, he listed right livelihood among the eight keys to an enlightened life. He knew somehow that work was important and that working right was essential. As he traveled through ancient India, spreading the word about his newfound path of spiritual liberation, he preached not only to other wandering monks like himself and eventually nuns, but also to those he called householders, who he encouraged to follow his teachings while remaining in the workaday world. Even two plus millennia ago, Buddha understood that most of us would spend much of our waking lives working and would have to find our enlightenment there. Buddha was raised among the privileged 1% of his day and became an honored guest of kings and queens, but he was also surrounded by subsistence farmers, artisans, and small-scale merchants who struggled to survive. The Buddhist scriptures, usually called the sutras, 
refer to dozens of professions already practiced in Buddha's time, and his audiences included everyone from royalty to slaves. For most people hearing the Buddha's words, work was a necessary and central part of their daily lives. He couldn't ignore it then, any more than we can ignore it now. Enlightenment was not something just for full-time monastics. So Buddha knew that helping ordinary people work right was essential to helping them find their own path of awakening. That's what this book is about, how to make our work not just another distraction, but an integral part of truly waking up. This book will help you understand why Buddha, a guy who never held a job, chose to elevate right livelihood to such importance. Most importantly, we'll explore how to find a way of working that's right in every sense of that word. Right for you, right for your health, right for your sanity, and right for the world. And maybe I'll stop there and we can uh, we can start our conversation. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon. As as you were as you were going through it, I was um, <laughs> I was reflecting a lot. Uh, so you, you've already given you've already given me and I'm sure the audience um, a lot to think about. Um, so yeah, just kind of getting into it. I guess I guess my you know my first question is it's is pretty high level, and um, I know this answer because I've known you for, for for many years. But I think the audience might be curious. Um, how did you get interested in meditation and Buddhism? Well, so I, I've been interested in meditation and in Buddhism in particular um, ever since college. And so pretty much my whole adult life has had these two threads of, of my work in tech and my, my interest in, in Buddhist meditation. Uh, like a lot of people, you know, I read a book in college that, that, uh, that someone gave to me called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. I, um, somehow it, it, uh, it sparked something and I remember very clearly like going off to the corner of my dorm and like sitting on a pillow and meditating for the first time and thinking like this was something I really wanted to pursue. Um, you know, for, for most of my adult life, I, I felt like I kept those two streams pretty separate. Mm -hmm. um, and but, you know, recently I've started to think about how they kind of are, are, are merging more together and that it's really out of that merging that this book kind of emerged. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. That's that's fascinating. So it started. So it started in college. And um, have you been practicing um, Buddhism ever since? Pretty much. So um, I, uh, you know, I, I sort of dabbled while I was in college. I, I visited uh, a couple uh, Zen centers. I visited the Zen Center in Los Angeles. Uh, I visited here in San Francisco. Um, and then actually after college, I decided, you know, this is really what I wanted to pursue. And I, and I actually moved to Asia uh, and lived in Thailand for a little while in a Buddhist temple. Um, and uh, I sort of had the idea that maybe I was just gonna, that was just gonna be what I was gonna do. I was gonna be a Buddhist monk and that would be the end of it. Um, but then like most things in our life, especially uh, you know in our twenties, things didn't go quite the way I planned. Mm -hmm. uh, I ended up falling in love and getting married and having to earn a living. And so, uh, and so that's when I kind of restarted this other strand in my life of, of technology and, and work. I see. I see. Oh, that's fascinating. So, so, so there was a point in your life where where you didn't see the you didn't see tech being part of your future, but then kind of things changed for you, and yet you were able to keep Buddhism in your daily life and even bring them together. It sounds like uh, that I've tried, and you know, I think at different points, I I you know had my, my focus would would shift more on one or more on the other. Um, but so you know, I don't think I've ever. Uh, left meditation kind of behind, but there definitely been times when work was super intense or, you know, when I was just starting my family that I was spending a little less of my uh, kind of attention on that. But mm -hmm. I've always tried to keep both of them alive. I see. I see. I see. Oh, uh, that's great. That's great. That, that Thank you for that, for, for telling us a little bit about your journey. Um, uh, kind of shifting into talking about the book a little bit, you know, what, what motivated you to write this particular book? And also maybe, you know, your, the overall series, you know, I know this is a, you're, this is not the first book you've written, um, kind of leveraging the teachings of Buddha. Yeah. You know, this book in particular, as I said, really came out of my attempts to, in a sense, bring together these strands in my life that I had for a long time really kept separate. You know, even during much of the time I was at Google, um, I really thought about my uh, my meditation and my Buddhist practice as something I mostly did kind of on my own time, not not so much when I was at work. I went just a handful of times to some of the meditation sessions, you know, at Google. But I really thought of it as, you know, I'm either working or I'm 
practicing meditation, but I'm not trying to do both at the same time. Um, and, you know, over the years, uh, that's just started to feel like just not such a healthy way of, of, of living that I sort of felt that I was, I was leaving an important part of myself behind when I came to work. Um, and so I tried to just sort of experiment of, you know, what would it be like to like bring my whole self to work and, and to bring with me this kind of meditation practice and, and, and my, my sort of Buddhist background. Um, and I liked it. I liked it more. I liked the idea that, that I could somehow bring these two uh, aspects of my life together. Um, and I felt like I was more of my authentic self. And so after doing that for a few years, I started to feel like maybe other people would would also like to kind of be more of their whole self at work um, mm -hmm. and to think of work as less of a distraction from, from their real life and more just like an integral part of this whole life they were living. Um, and so I started, you know, writing down some thoughts and, and those thoughts, you know, ultimately became this book. I see, I see, I see. Um, I, 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 you know, as, as you talk about the whole self and the authentic self and bringing these things together, um, I was I was thinking, um, could you tell us a little bit about how bringing that into your work life has changed how you personally approach work? Yeah, you know, as I said, when I was younger, I really thought of work as this thing I had to do. Like I, I had I had one plan which did not involve me going into the tech industry, and then I realized, well, okay, no, I need to make a living, so I, I need to go to work. And you know, I was one of these people who you know, had a spreadsheet telling me, you know, when I would be able to stop working maybe. And, uh, you know, was really thinking of it as this thing that I'm doing because I have to, but I don't, I don't really want to be doing it. And, and I did literally think of it as a distraction from, from the rest of my life. Um, and, you know, I can't quite remember exactly when that started to shift, but, but I think, you know, around the time that I joined Google, um, so this was in the, in the like mid two thousands, um, I started to realize that there were lots of things about my work that I really liked um, and that it wasn't, you know, it, it certainly wasn't just a distraction and maybe it didn't need to be a distraction at all. And that I could start to think of work as an opportunity to practice certain things that, that were important to me. Um, you know, maybe one of the most obvious is like an opportunity to practice kind of compassion that, mm -hmm. you know, whenever you're working with someone, whenever you're having some, any kind of, you know, face-to-face -face interaction with someone, that's an opportunity to treat that person as a, as a real person, as a, as a human being, and to have a real authentic interaction with that person. It's also an opportunity to practice mindfulness, to try to be present, to not try to just be distracted. And, and uh, you know, neither of those things is necessarily easy to do at work. Um, but I do think if you start to look at work as an opportunity to, to engage in those kinds of practices, um, it it really changes your perspective on the whole thing. Yes, yes, that's a that, that, that's a really excellent point. Especially, the, I I have to strongly plus one the last thing you said. It's not easy to stay mindful, especially in our modern world of of you know information coming coming at us from every angle, and 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 yet you know um, uh, to be effective at work and to be an effective collaborator, we absolutely have to be mindful. It it, it really does it does make a difference in how people perceive you and how you even come come to come to the tasks at hand. Um, that's great. Um, I'd like to shift a little bit and talk kind of about this very difficult year, 2020. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that all, I mean, and, you know, uh, all of us are, are, are dealing with different things, of course, you know, and, 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 and I would never, um, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, speak so much about the challenges of working from home and light of people, you know, who are, who are losing loved ones, but, you know, there is just a lot of change and a lot of difficulty across both a lot of people at Google and, and, and in our computer industry, but all around the world. And, and, and so I, I'm curious in light of 2020, you know, um, how, how, in what ways do you feel that mindfulness and the practice of meditation in particular um, are particularly relevant for all of us um, that are trying to work under these circumstances? I mean, it certainly is an incredibly challenging year in so many ways, and and you're right. It's it's uh, it's of course most challenging for the people that are that are actually dealing with the disease itself, or, or have loved ones who are. Um, and uh, and we could talk a little bit about about how to deal with those kind of challenges. But but those of us where our main challenges is is trying to continue our our working life under these circumstances. You know, I do think it makes it it really highlights this idea that that work 
isn't really just this like separate thing um, that now more than ever, it, you know, it, it is just a part of our life um, that we can't so easily compartmentalize uh, off to the side. Um, and that can be both good and bad. Uh, I think the, the negative parts, of course, is, is when people start to feel like they're just always working. Um, that work kind of starts to bleed into e to, to everything else that they're trying to do. The positive parts are, are I think, again, allowing us to, to be more of our authentic self at work. You know, I think, you know, just to, to bring up some almost trivial examples, you know, I, I think early in, in our experience of, of this, you know, crazy work at home time, you know, people were embarrassed if, if their kid or their dog, you know, walked by where they're in a meeting. I think at some point we all realized, like, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. Like, we know that you have kids and dogs and like, that doesn't have to be a secret. You don't have to kind of pretend that you have no life other than work. Um, you know, early on, we might have, you know, tried to put screens behind us or use backgrounds. But then, you know, at some point we realized, okay, like it, people realize that we're taking these calls from our office or I'm in my garage actually here. Um, nice we don't have to, thank you. We, we don't have to pretend that we're not doing that. Um, and so I think perhaps we've all gotten a little more used to the idea that we can, that we can be ourselves. We don't have to pretend to be something else. We don't have to pretend to be, um, you know, people that, that have no identity outside of, of, of our work identity. Um, so I think that's quite positive. I, back on the challenging side, you know, there's now even more potential distractions for us. So, you know, before you might go to a meeting and you'd be distracted by your phone. If you brought your laptop with you, you might be distracted by your laptop and emails right. coming in. Right. Now you still have both of those things, but you also have everything else. You have, you know, the neighbors walking by, you have, again, your kids or your pets, you know, walking by, you have, uh, you know, other, you know, maybe lunch that you need, that you're responsible for, or someone's homework or, or schoolwork that you have to help with. Um, and so I think we have to be even more aware of our attention and, uh, and treating our attention as the scarce resource that it is and yeah. being, um, being deliberate about where we give our attention at, at various times, when we're going to give our attention, you know, to our, to our work and to our, into our devices and when we need to take our attention and, and, and give it elsewhere. Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's great advice and, and very much lines with my own personal experience. Um, you know, just before this call, my, my 13 year old was, was yelling and I was, I was, I was hoping, would he quiet down in time for us to do the live stream? And thankfully he did. <laughs> so I know exactly what you mean about, about how do you stay centered and mindful in, in, in the moment. Um, it, 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 in, in, in the, when you're, when you're really trying to focus on a task as, as we are here, you know, bringing this presentation to, to folks. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I, I kind of, kind of focusing a little bit on, on the tech, the, 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 the technology industry, you know, and overall, um, you know, which you, you've had a long distinguished career at places like Microsoft, Google, um, and Facebook, um, and, 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 and I've obviously seen a lot in your career. Um, um, and, and, and have worked on very important products, including both YouTube and, and, and Instagram that are very, very deeply involved in people's day-to-day -day lives now. I'm curious, um, do you think that, that mindfulness has become more difficult with this deeply connected world? Um, and and are, are these technologies, which we all you know, agree are so powerful and so amazing, but are they are they are they helping or are they are they hurting with um, our need as people to stay mindful? It's a really difficult question. So, you know, I I, I talked a little bit in the reading I did about uh, about Buddha himself and and his enlightenment experience twenty five hundred years ago. Uh, one thing I didn't get to in that section um, was, you know, Buddha had this great awakening. He he became literally the the awakened one. Um, and his first inclination was actually just to, just to stop, not to become a teacher or anything. Just like you know, he he had he had found his bliss, um, and he was he was done. And his reason for not wanting to teach is he he literally thought that these practices that he had developed, mindfulness and so forth, uh, were too hard, mm -hmm. and that people people wouldn't get it. And so he worried a lot about distraction um, and about uh, the difficulty of mindfulness twenty five hundred years ago. And when you think about it. You know, that's not just before 
smartphones and laptops and television and radio. That's before paper. Um, so <laughs> you know, if you were to make a list of all the things that you find distracting in your life, you know, the vast majority of those and possibly all of them didn't even exist at that time. And yet he's still worried about distraction. And, and I think the reason for that is that in some ways, you know, that list that, that you or I would make about the things that distract us is a little bit misleading because the thing that's really distracting us is not actually the phone and not actually the screen. It, it's our own minds. We're being distracted by our own thoughts, our own thinking. Mm -hmm. It's our, it, it's that um, sort of desire to check your phone that's really distracting you right. more so than the phone itself. Um, and that's been around forever. So that doesn't really answer your question about whether these technologies are making it better or worse, but it, it is saying that they didn't start from technology. Distraction isn't a new problem. It's a very, very old problem. Um, I do worry a little that that all of this work that, that people like yourself and, and myself and, and everybody who's, who's watching this uh, do, um, isn't necessarily making things better. I, you know, I, I've been using, uh, I started coding, you know, when I was very young, I've basically been using computers my whole life. I think if I went back through in time and, and talked to that, that little, I was called Danny back then, talked to Danny um, about sort of what, what this technology was gonna do in the future, there was no doubt in my mind that it would be, you know, incredibly positive, um, that it would, it would make the world a much better place. Having now spent several decades in the industry, it is a little disappointing, but although it's made things better in many ways, it hasn't made it better in every way. Um, and it does seem in, in some ways to be preying on, on some of our, um, uh, you know, sort of least, least good qualities. Um, and so I do think those of us who continue to work in technology, certainly including myself, you know, have an obligation to try to make it as positive a force for uh, for the world, including for, for our attention as we can. Right, right, right. thank you. Um, the, the, the thing you said a moment ago about uh, it's not the device, it's the temptation to look at the device. Um, mm -hmm. That's a very powerful thing. Um, I know um, I'll, I'll be sitting in meetings, of course, it's it's a little different now that we're, that we're all working from home, but I think back to the not too distant past when we were sitting in a conference room, I could feel that tem temptation welling up in me. It's almost like the need for additional stimulation. And so one of my personal practices is I, I somewhat loudly will flip my phone upside down. And it's, yeah. not, it's not really a signal to people in the, in the meeting. It's really a signal to myself. Okay, now you're locking in and it's important that you, that you pay the respect and the attention that, that, that your, colleagues are, uh, your colleagues deserve as, as you might be walking through a presentation or reviewing and design or, or, or what have you. So I, I do think that, that calling that out is important and maybe as part of, as all of us try to journey um, and try to get on this journey to being more mindful Remind, remind, reminding it's not the device that's the problem, it's our temptation that's the thing we have to kind of kind of work against is, is really important. So I'm glad. That sounds like a great, a great practice, I, I think. Uh, and, and it really gets to this point that it, it's, it's an intention. Being mindful is an intention. It, it's a decision that, that you make. Nice. Um, I don't know that it comes naturally to anybody. Um, it certainly doesn't come naturally to me. Yeah. Um, and in fact, quite the opposite. If I am sitting in a meeting and I do pick up my phone for some reason, it could be 10 minutes before I put it down again and, and actually pay attention to what's going on around me because it's so easy to get sucked in right. if you don't make that deliberate effort to, to stay present. Yes, yes, 100%. I, I, can, I, I can think of so many times where I, where I haven't done it well and it's just a reminder uh, to, to, that, that's a, that that's something to aspire to. I also think it's, it's important, you know, as, as colleagues, if we're giving, if we're taking the time, taking someone else's time, we have to make sure that we're that we're repaying that by giving them the attention that they that they so richly deserve. Yeah, you know something I, I said earlier about what it means to bring to bring these practices to work. I, I mentioned compassion and treating each interaction you have with someone at work um, as an opportunity to practice compassion, and and a piece of that is is just being present because in some ways, you know. I suppose it's not the least compassionate thing you could do, but but one of the least compassionate things you could do is just kind of ignoring the person that that's right in front of you, um, and right. uh, and so often we end up doing that, not realizing that that's what we're doing, um, right. and not realizing that we're we've, we're letting slip away this opportunity to to be compassionate and to be present with the person that's right in front of us. Right, 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 right. That's true. That's true. Um, thank thank you for that. 
Um, uh, we're, we're, we're getting an amazing number of questions from folks on the stream. So I just oh, have, cool. I have, I have a couple more, um, that I, that I thought, um, from my list that I thought we'd go through and then we'll, 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 we'll um, go to the broader group. Um, so, so kind of getting back to, to, you know, our employer, Google and your former employer, um, you know, meditation has been popular at, at Google, uh, for, for, for a really long time. I mean, you mentioned you joined in the two thousands. And I know that there were folks that were that were deeply involved in it even back then. Um, you know, why why do you think um, that Google is a place that's embraced meditation? You know, so so partly it, it exists in this in this broader context of, of Silicon Valley, which which also has had a, a history of of some connection to meditation. The the Bay Area, uh, you know, is both this sort of hotbed of technology uh, and and kind of a hotbed of Buddhism in this country, the, the largest, probably the largest um, Zen organization uh, is the San Francisco Zen Center uh, based in uh, San Francisco. And actually that book that I mentioned, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind is a collection of talks that the founder of the San Francisco Zen Center gave, but actually didn't give in San Francisco, gave in someone's living room in Los Altos. Cause even back then, he was coming down here to give talks to people living in what we now call Silicon Valley. Um, you know, I think Google in particular had a lot of people that were, you know, that had a couple of impulses. I think one is, you know, wanting to make the world a better place and, and feeling some, some commitment to that. And two, you know, wanting to um, better themselves. Um, and I think those two impulses kind of combined to, to, make people think about meditation as something that could help uh, in those things. And then, you know, I think I have to say there was a particular individual who was an er early employee uh, at Google, Meng, uh, mm -hmm. who's, uh, who's famous because he had so many famous people take pictures with him. Uh, I know he's since left uh, not too many years ago, but, you know, he was a real advocate for meditation as something that would help Googlers do better work. Right. Um, and so really uh, help get that going. So I think there are a lot of strands that came together, but um, but Google really has been at the forefront of kind of bringing meditation into the workplace. I see, I see. That's that that that, that, that that's great. Kind of a kind of just a follow up, kind of tying up a couple a couple strands we talked about with um you know uh, all all of us needing to work from home, or, or the vast majority of us needing to work from home for for um, several more months um, uh, or quarters, um, and 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 the history of Google as a as a as a place where Meditation was, you know, considered a a, a really important thing, and 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 in the valley as well. Um, what are some suggestions that you have for the folks listening today to kind of bring meditation into their daily work practice, especially in this work from home setup? Yeah, you know, I do think trying to establish some sort of daily practice is really valuable. Um, that often sounds really intimidating to people, but it, it doesn't have to be. Um, well, it doesn't have to be intimidating. I think practicing sitting meditation for as little as 10 minutes a day uh, is incredibly valuable. Um, when people are just starting out, I usually recommend just sitting for five minutes, uh, working your way up to 10, and then maybe staying at 10 for, for a long time, um, perhaps indefinitely. I think um, most of us can carve out that amount of time. I think as you start getting into 20 and 30 minutes, it becomes something you've got to schedule. But when it's more at like the 10 minute level, it's usually something you can just kind of squeeze in without having to go block your calendar and, and, and make a big production out of it. Um, I do think although, you know, meditation may seem like a solitary pursuit um, and certainly Buddha's, you know, original meditation was, you know, by himself under a tree, you know, these days, many of us meditate together. And so that is a bit of a challenge uh, these days when we can't, you know, either go to one of the meditation rooms at Google or go to somewhere like the San Francisco Zen Center and meditate in a group. But the nice thing is that there's lots of online meditation. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you have that ability to meditate with other people even at home. And then there's great apps. There's uh, Insight Timer, Headspace, Calm, where you can do a, uh, a 10 minute meditation by yourself, but still have some kind of help in doing it. Um, so I, I, anything you can do to get into a regular practice of meditation yeah. um, and, Although in some ways, you know, this current work at home environment may make that more challenging, you know, in other ways, our schedules are perhaps a little more flexible. It, it may make it easier to carve out that extra 10 minutes at the beginning or end of your day um, to just to just sit by yourself. Right. I guess a lot of us have some commute time, which 
hopefully we're getting back. So that's that's a great place to spend five or ten minutes um, uh, and meditate. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna Absolutely. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that commitment here. I'm gonna carve out five minutes a day starting starting today to to do that. So thank wonderful, you for that. wonderful. Um, we have we have a we have a, as I mentioned um, uh, uh, several questions from from folks on the on the stream. So I thought we jump into those and then you know um, uh, we can just kind of see where the conversation goes from there. How does that sound? Sounds great. Great. Okay. So the first question is from uh, Chris. So Chris um, asks, what type of meditation do you do? Um, and and kind of along the lines of what we just talked about, has anything changed in your own personal practice since COVID? Uh, so. My own kind of uh, lineage of Buddhism is is what we call Zen Buddhism, which is this kind of branch of Buddhism that went from from India, where it started, into China, from China to Japan, and from Japan uh, here to the Bay Area. Um, and uh, and so I practice what's called Zen meditation, which is a, a very simple kind of stripped down, literally just sitting uh, and not trying to have any particular thoughts in my head, just just trying to be fully present and fully uh, mindful uh, during the time that I'm that I'm sitting. Um, I, in terms of, has anything changed in my practice uh, since COVID? Um, in some ways, I do find it easier to have that morning meditation time. Again, I don't have the commute. Uh, I'm in a little more control of my schedule. Um, uh, you know, if I I can I can sit before I take a shower, after I take a shower. Like I don't, I those kinds of things can be sort of rearranged as needed. At the same time, though, you know. Like everybody, I, I have new demands on on me in terms of you know helping with things around the house, helping uh, helping my kids with what they're doing. Um, so I you know I would say it's been mixed, and there are times where I find it easier to, to you know go and sit. I, I sit about twenty minutes most mornings to find those twenty minutes, and times where I where I find it a little more difficult with all the other things going on uh, in our lives. I see. That's great. Thanks, Dan. Um, the next question is from Abe or or Abe. Um, while most of us associate um, a self journey with Buddha, how does it reflect on a team journey more broadly with a larger group? Do you have any advice about that? You know, as I said, I, I although in some ways meditation and 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 Buddhist practice is is by nature a solitary pursuit, it is also something that most of us do in groups today. Uh, you know, we'll sit together with other people, uh, even you know monks who dedicate and nuns who dedicate their lives to this generally don't do so in a solitary way, they do so together. Um, and, and I also think many of the kinds of practices like compassion and, and mindfulness are practices that, that lend themselves well to working together and working with a group. Now, I don't know, you know whether you can sort of have a group awakening exactly, uh, you know, that may be something that still happens to the individual, but it is certainly something that you can do together and you can support each other in doing it. Um, you know, certainly I, I've, I know that there are teams where everybody on the team meditates together um, and, and find that as something that helps kind of uh, create a certain like, you know, unity and sense of purpose um, that can be really valuable. Yeah. And, and to your point about online meditation groups, perhaps that's even a way to bring teams closer together that would, that are, that are challenging are challenged right now while all of us are, are sort of working from home or many of us are working from home. Yep. Uh, that's, that, 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 that's great. Thank you. Um, Evan, Evan writes, uh, often the times that we want to skip meditation, like when we're busy or stressed, are the times when we need it the most. Um, so he asks, um, do you have any thoughts on how we can make space for meditation when it simply feels like there's no room? Um, I, so first of all, I, I completely agree with the premise of the question that, um, that the times where we feel we don't have time can be the most important times to do it. Um, you know, to some extent, it's a commitment you make to yourself, like any other commitment, like a commitment to exercise, like a commitment to get enough sleep. Um, and at some level, you know, you, you have to just make that commitment to yourself and 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 uh, and honor that commitment. Um, I remember hearing from a teacher once uh, who said, you know, he wouldn't leave the house without having meditated first any more than he would leave the house without having brushed his teeth. That and mm -hmm. and and almost like for the same reason that he thought it, it was part of of almost uh, uh, you know, bringing uh, a proper version of himself out into the world, um, that he wouldn't want to walk around with with sort of a, a bad mindset any more than he want to walk around with bad breath. Um, <laughs> and, I like that. And so I do think thinking of it as something that you're doing 
not just for yourself, but for everyone around you as a way of reminding yourself to um, to be present and to practice compassion, then can make it feel a little less uh, selfish in a way. I think sometimes we, we don't do it because we think we don't have time because of commitments we have to other people. But so to also think of this as a commitment you have kind of broadly, almost part of your social contract with the world that you're going to you're going to try to be present. And in order to do that, you need to take this time to, to let your mind settle a bit. I really like that framing. You know, um, uh, it, it, yes, I think most of us have, have all would all agree that you should brush your teeth before leaving the house. In the <laughs> so why not, why not brush your mind? That makes perfect sense. Um, I like yeah. that. I like that. Uh, okay, the next commenter is Joe. Um, oh, we'll put neat plus one to Evan's um, uh, questions. So that's great. Um, uh, Joe comments, um, I too moved to Thailand and spent some time in a Buddhist temple, uh, Plum Village. Uh, so so your talk it really resonates. Uh, while it's easy to be mindful in the temple, um, but it's it, it's just very hard to do so in America, especially in uh, New York City. Um. So you know, I I think it's true. It, it's not it's not easy. Um, I mentioned in the reading I did that Buddha taught both monks and nuns and and lay people who he called householders, um, and he did think awakening was possible for for everyone. But one of the things he said is he thought it was easier to to live as a monk or a nun. That sounds um, that sounds off to many of us who think of it as being a hardship. To, to go off and live in some austere temple and, and get up at maybe four in the morning and meditate all day. Um, and it is hard in some ways, um, but you know what's, what's easier about it is the lack of distractions. Um, and the fact that you're stripping away a lot of the things that, that cause us to lose that, that mindfulness and, and that presence. Um, and so it does take extra effort to try to maintain that, uh, that mindfulness in, uh, in a big city like New York or, or in, here in Silicon Valley. Um, I talk about meditation and mindfulness as a practice, and, and I really do think of it as practice in the literal sense, in the same way that you might practice the piano. Um, you know, you practice the piano, you do these like finger exercises and things, and that's not because you're trying to get good at finger exercises. It's because after that, you then want to be able to play the piano, uh, which is really a very different thing. Similarly, you know, my, my kids learned to drive a few years ago, and, and you might practice driving like in an empty parking lot where you, you know, practice your turns, you practice parking. And again, that's not because it's particularly useful to be good at driving in a parking lot. It's because that practice is something you can then take with you when you get out on the road. Mm -hmm. um, but you're not really driving until you're out on the road. Um, and so I, I think the same about meditation, that, that meditation, whether you're doing it in your house, uh, my spot is, is right over here, um, or in a temple, um, it, it's practicing mindfulness so that you get a little better, you develop some some kind of internal muscle memory um, that you can then bring that mindfulness into these much more difficult situations. Because in some ways, those are the situations where it really counts. It's it's considerably easier to be mindful when you're in a quiet room, maybe facing a wall, maybe even closing your eyes. You know, you are deliberately eliminating most of those distractions. Like we talked about, all you've got left is really the distraction of your own mind. Because if you can overcome it there, then it starts to get a little more possible to to overcome distraction once you start layering on top of it, you know, traffic noise and 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 children and pets and work and and phones and 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 other screens. Um, you're you're building up these muscles that you can then call on in these other situations. Oh, I I, I, I like that analogy. Um, finger exercises lead to <laughs> mental exercises lead to mindfulness. That's great. Uh, uh, great. Uh, the, the the next commenter is Shep. Um, and Chef says, you know, often um, when I think about making my life and work life healthier, I wonder if I'm starting from a place of privilege, and I wonder how these lessons apply to those who are less fortunate, um, if at all. Um, I mean, many of us are uh, starting from a place of privilege. That that's just the fact of of our of our lives for many of us, uh, particularly here in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, we've talked already about how for many people. Uh, COVID-19 is, is, is an existential crisis, either for their own health or, or their jobs have been wiped out. Um, so those of us who are, who are fortunate to be, to be working and to be healthy, um, as well as, as to be in an industry that pays reasonably well and so forth, you know, we are for sure starting from a place of privilege. I still think that many of these uh, 
techniques apply to people that are maybe in a point of, of less privilege. And as I mentioned, you know, Buddha himself had students who were servants and, e and even, even slaves, even the least privileged of their uh, society, and still felt there were opportunities to practice mindfulness, to practice, to be present, to be compassionate, um, to treat the interactions you have with others as an opportunity to, uh, to, to meet them as a whole person and, and to grow from that experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it certainly is easier to, to find time to meditate if you control your own schedule um, and much harder if you don't. Uh, but I, I, I would hope that, that even people that are in much less privileged uh, situations can find, um, can find some comfort in bringing these practices into, into those workplaces as well. Got it. Um, just asking my own quick follow-up on that. Do you think that meditation is something that should be taught in schools then? Um, I guess I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. Um, uh, one of my daughters did uh, have some meditation in her school and the other one didn't. I, I think it was useful and valuable. Um, it does seem though like it is, uh, meditation may be something that's, easier for adults to understand than for kids who, who just don't quite have the self-awareness. Um, I'll never forget when I tried to teach my own daughter to meditate when she was, I don't know, maybe four, pretty young. Um, and we both like, you know, sat in the room and kind of turned down the lights. And, and because I thought it would be easier for her, I suggested we both close our eyes. Um, and almost as soon as my eyes were closed, uh, she stood up and kicked me in the head um, to, to get me to... <laughs> she, she just she decided this wasn't really for her so um i have not heard that story before <laughs> so uh uh you know i do think it may be something that's best uh best approached as an adult i see i see that that that, that makes sense <laughs> based, on, based on your data on the topic that makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, the, the the next comment is from josh or joshua excuse me um uh, my favorite humorous quote on making time is, everyone should meditate 10 minutes per day. And if you're too busy to do that, then you should sit for 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I get the question a lot of how much meditation is enough. Uh, you know, is it really enough to sit for 10 minutes a day or even 15 minutes? And, you know, I don't know that there's an answer for that. And I think e each of us uh, needs to find what, what works for us. Um, you know, I'm told that the Dalai Lama uh, His Holiness still meditates for several hours a day, and he's been doing it his whole life. So, and yet he still seems to feel that it's important and useful to to continue to meditate that much. Um, but I think of it as kind of like exercise. You know, is it enough to do ten minutes of exercise a day? I mean, it's much better than doing none, and right. it's you know, and it's better than doing five. And so, I would say to carve out the time that you can. I think the more important thing is to try to make that commitment and to do it consistently. And to not make the commitment be so big, I, I was reading on on Facebook someone who was committing during COVID nineteen to meditate two hours a day. Wow. I mean, that's wonderful if he can do it. I think for most of us, we would make that commitment and then literally never do it. Um, and so I would rather have us uh, commit to ten minutes and actually follow through. Yeah. Um, I, my, my sample size is is just of one person, and um, I've been an intermittent meditator probably since about the time I met you back in two thousand six. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that I am way more than 10 minutes more productive on the days when I sit for 10 minutes. <laughs> That's great. That's so great. For, for, for one data point, hopefully it, hopefully it pencils out. And, and, and maybe that's something that other people can, can remember. But Josh, I really like your comment. Joshua, excuse me. I really like your comment. Thank you. Um, uh, Robert um, has, a, has, a, has a comment as well. Um, this is a little bit longer. So I'll, I'm going to read it through. And then, and then um, Dan, you can jump in. Um, uh, hi, Dan. Thanks for giving this talk. Yes, and plus one on that. Um, I've been trying to bring more mindfulness into my daily life, and I find it quite challenging to do so while working, um, especially while coding. I have thought about experimenting with doing things like trying to maintain breath awareness while coding or trying to maintain awareness of sitting against the chair, but all of these seem incredibly challenging to actually do. Is it, it, it is hard enough to maintain breath awareness while sitting and meditating, as you know. Do you have any advice? Um, you know, I think mindfulness is not necessarily about always being mindful of your, of your breathing per se, um, 
you know, it's about giving your full attention to the to the task at hand. So for example, as we're talking, I'm trying to give my full attention to this conversation, to to your words when, when you speak, to my words when I speak. Um, so one approach when you're coding would be to just try to give your full attention to that task of coding um, and and not to try simultaneously to uh, to be aware of your breath or of your position in your chair. I'm not sure that either of those practices are, are bad at all, um, but if you can give yourself kind of wholeheartedly to that task of coding and give that your full attention, um, to me, that, that is, that's a, that's a perfect example of, of mindfulness. Uh, and when people hear about mindfulness for the first time, maybe who, who have not um, you know, tried to practice meditation, you know, often what rings true to them are, are times in the past where they've kind of been in the zone uh, doing something, whether that's yes. something like coding or, or doing art or doing sports, where they feel like, oh yeah, that one time that I was you know, at bat at Little League or something, I was fully present in that moment. There was nothing else I was thinking of than that one moment of the ball and trying to hit the ball. Um, you know, that person is not focusing on their breathing or, or maybe even on their posture. They're just in that moment of being at bat. And I, I think you could take that same perspective to, uh, to coding. That's great. That's great. I think that, 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 that that's a really important distinction, which is that mindfulness is good and meditation is also good. And it's a, and they and they may come together or they may not in a given in a given day and for a given person. Uh, Joe remarks, um, I came back to work, uh, joined Google and came back to America on a mission to help people in the world. Yet it is difficult to remain mindful while while trying to affect change. Maybe your book could help. Uh, well, I, I hope it can. Um, I think, um, you know, there, there's many ways to help people in the world. As I said, there's, um, you know, when many people think about dedicating themselves to helping people, they think about, um, you know, becoming a doctor or nurse or, you know, going and, and feeding the poor and, and uh, working with people that are very disadvantaged. And certainly those are all wonderful things to do. And, and there are many opportunities right now, probably in every community to, to do that kind of, of very direct helping work. You can also help people just in your daily interactions. As I said, you can bring kindness and compassion to literally everybody that you encounter. Um, and just through that presence, whether that's people at work or people uh, at the grocery store, you know, one very small practice that I've uh, started since this COVID-19 um, pandemic is that when I go grocery shopping, you know, I thank the checkout clerk. Um, and I don't know why it had like never occurred to me to do that before, but it just didn't. But suddenly I realized that if this person hadn't shown up for work, like I wouldn't be able to get food. Um, and, that the, and that that was like not an abstract possibility. That was a real possibility that, um, you know, people were not always able to come to work. Um, and so just that little that little bit of like wanting to be to be thankful and, and to acknowledge the the work of, of that person, um, I feel is one way to, to, to help people in the world. Um, uh, you know, Joe mentions the difficulty of being mindful while trying to affect change. Um, it's true. But I think, again, it's, it's always difficult to be mindful, um, regardless of the work you're doing. But I think it can help the first the first step to affecting change is to is to see what it is that needs to be changed, and and mindfulness is really the practice of trying to see things as they as they truly are, um, and so it forces us to be present with all of the things in the world uh, that are causing suffering that do need to change, um, and so I think it can help us find those those opportunities to make the world better. Thank you, thank you. That's great. Um, uh, just. Um, Keeping an eye on the clock, we have about six questions and eight minutes. So uh, uh, I just want to make sure we get through all these. These are great questions, by the way. Thank you, folks, for for who who uh, who've been able to contribute. Uh, Wen Chin asks, uh, "My temple has been closed since January in reaction to COVID nineteen, and it has been incredibly challenging to lose that weekly touchstone." Um, and we talked about this a little bit, but I'd love to hear a little bit more of your thoughts on this. Can you speak to what bringing what you had in a temple space to home has looked like? You know, one of the things that's been interesting in this in this time is moving so many activities that we used to do face to face online. Um, and and you know, this talk is a good example. I, a couple times when I was at Google, I hosted uh, these author talks, 
And, you know, as I recall, we'd be lucky to get 20, maybe 30 people if it was a pretty good author. Nice. Um, I actually can't see the count right now, but, but uh, um, you know, often in these kinds of uh, events, we can get more people than we could physically. And I think, um, you know, meditation groups are seeing something similar where the San Francisco Zen Center, for example, has moved its daily meditation onto Zoom and are getting, you know, sometimes several hundred people where, again, they'd be lucky to get a couple dozen to actually show up at, at six in the morning in, in San Francisco uh, right. to meditate there. So if you can find an online meditation, I think that's a that's a great way uh, to do it. If you can create a space in your home that is dedicated to meditation, even just a corner. I have this little space here next to my desk, and it's the only thing I do in that space. And so it's it's a, in a sense my own little temple that I have here. Um, you know, sometimes that can bring that same feeling, that same kind of touchstone uh, as well. Yeah, and I, I want to plus one the thing you just said. Uh, my wife has a particular pillow. And that mm -hmm. pillow is only used for meditation. And, you know, that pillow has been with us in many houses and on several That's trips great. over the years. So she creates her temple <laughs> wherever she goes uh, uh, with that with that particular pillow. So um, I think I think there are there are things we can all try. Um, but but definitely your, your idea of these kind of online groups is also really interesting because that it, it is an interesting point that one of the side effects of this wonderful, you know, of this of this horrible pandemic is this wonderful opportunity to maybe connect with people that we wouldn't we wouldn't connect with otherwise. Right. OK, I, 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 I want to make sure we get through everybody. So we'll go a little faster. Mason asks, do you have any advice on encouraging people in your life to meditate when they are resistant to the idea? You know, as I was saying a little bit about getting kids to meditate, I do think it's something you have to want to do. I think you can't you can't force somebody to meditate in part because meditation is is sort of a state of mind. And so even if you got them to, to sit still, you couldn't actually make them meditate while they were sitting there. Um, I often think the best way to do it is just to do it yourself and have people see the results of that meditation and then want those results you know, for themselves as well. Um, I think that's probably the most effective way of convincing other people to give it a try. Yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. Um, uh, Dimitri, oh, Dan, you'll, 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 you'll like this one because as a manager at Google for many years, um, you remember perf season, uh, yeah. and, and, and we've, uh, we, we, we reached that point uh, in the last week or so. So Dimitri, uh, asks, are there any tricks for making the less enjoyable parts of an engineer's work like perf, uh, but also certain types of presentations and documents, uh, more enjoyable? You know, as I've talked about a few times, I, I try to look at these interactions as opportunities to practice. So PERF is a good example, like writing peer reviews, which which many people find um, potentially uh, onerous, let's say. You know, I really try to think when I, when I do those about what is it I would most like to communicate to this person? And how can I be most helpful to this person in this moment? Now, helpful doesn't mean just telling them lots of great stuff about themselves. That actually could be a, a very unhelpful thing if this person has something they need to work on that they don't seem to realize. Um, but to literally think about this person as a, as a friend, as a fellow human being, and ask like, wh what is the most important thing I could communicate to them that would be most helpful to them um, in trying to become the best version of themselves? Um, I, so I think trying to find ways of using these, uh, these as opportunities for that kind of practice, um, I, I don't know that it makes it more enjoyable for everyone, but it, it certainly makes it more enjoyable for me. Great. Great. That's that, that 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 that's really that's really positive advice. And you know, at this especially at this time when we really have to be there to support each other, both as colleagues and as people in society. I mean, thinking about it as as something you're giving you're giving to that other person, I think that really frames it up really well. And I'm starting working on peer reviews myself this week, so I'm going to remember that. <laughs> um, Katie Katie asks or Katie Katie comments. It's easy to feel stuck these days. Stuck inside stuck in a role, especially since um, companies like Google are limiting open roles. Um, how do you combat that feeling, um, of, of that feeling of, of being stuck? You know, in some ways, um, we're of course always stuck. Um, the, that the, this idea of not being stuck is sort of, is sort of an illusion. And one of the things that uh, I think this year has taught all of us is that this idea that we can sort of plan our whole life and, and know exactly how it's going to turn out, um, you know, maybe that holds true sometimes, but there's certainly no guarantees. Um, and and we have to be responsive to life as it actually is. 
in a sense, we're always stuck with the present moment. That's the only moment we get. And it's the only, it's the only moment we ever get. Um, and so our practice is always just how can we make the best of the moment that we have in front of us? Um, if there is again, any kind of silver lining to the situation we're in now, it, it's that it's really driven home that, that we just have to deal with what's in front of us and we can't control it. Um, and so, you know, I, I think trying to find ways to, uh, to grow and learn and practice in this moment, um, is, is the only way to ever get unstuck. Yeah. Well said, well said. Uh, Gerard um, asks, bringing work and personal life more together sounds like an important part of, of your journey, Dan. Um, and what specific boundaries have you found helpful to either remove or maintain? You know, I think the, the biggest thing was not feeling like I had to um, sort of construct and maintain a separate persona for work that it was okay if people at work knew who I really was. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when I look back, I, I was in, in sort of sp spending a lot of energy in kind of constructing who I wanted to be at work. And so to, you know, try to let that go a little bit and try to just, just try to be more of myself. At the same time, you know, absolutely, there are useful boundaries. So to make sure that I was spending time with my family, to make sure I was spending time on myself with meditation, you know, I actually don't love the term work-life balance because it suggests that there's just these two things, work and life. But of course, work is a part of life and it's and it's one of many things we have to balance in our life. We have to balance ourselves and our friends, ourselves and our family, our family and our friends, right. um, you know, our work and our leisure, um, sometimes our work and our, and our health. I mean, all kinds of things that we're trying to balance. Um, and so trying to make as deliberate a choice as I can about each of the balances is I think a uh, you know a central part of of trying to to be a whole person. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Nadia. Given that you ordained as a priest, did you ever consider longer term monastic practice? How has your relationship to monastic practice evolved over time? Uh, you know, I, I've thought about it a lot. I still think about it. Um, my kids are now uh, both uh, college age, although the younger one. Uh, isn't able to go off and start college yet because of the situation with uh, the pandemic. Um, and I have thought that maybe at some point as I have fewer responsibilities as a, as a householder, I might spend a, a longer time focused on meditation. Um, and I, I, I do think it can be very valuable for all the same reasons that the 10 minutes of meditation is valuable. You know, just like 10 minutes is valuable, taking a whole week to go and do a retreat can be very valuable and taking, you know, three months, which is a, a common, length of time for a monastic stay can be very uh, valuable. But I don't necessarily think it's essential. I do think that we can find these opportunities to practice throughout life. Um, and so I, I, you know, I can imagine that I might do a longer stay at some point. Um, but I also try not to sort of hold on to that as, as this ideal that I need to, uh, I need to strive for, and just try to bring this practice to, to everything that I'm doing. Great. So we have two questions left, but we we are running out of time. So Dan, can we do? We'll do we'll do short answer on these two. How okay, absolutely. Okay. So Anshika uh, asks, how does your vision um, uh, slash approach with respect to work and family um, how how has it evolved ever since you started practicing meditation? Are you inclined to do more of one over the other? I feel like you've covered this a little bit by talking about work life balance. Is there anything yeah, you want to add? I would just say I started meditation before I started actually either work or a family. So it was always, it was always present there. And mostly I've just tried to be as deliberate as I can in, in making choices about where to spend my time. And I think I've, there've been times where I was better at that than others, but that that to me is really the key is, is making the choice yourself rather than having someone impose it on you. Great. Okay. Last question. Um, uh, so this is from Harsha. I find activities like driving and running to have a similar effect to meditation. Is it possible or a good idea to replace sitting, observing your breath um, with an activity we might enjoy? You know, I, I think they are similar. I wouldn't consider it a replacement. I would still encourage people as much as possible to, to try to carve out that time to really just meditate. Just but five I think, minutes. Just five minutes. But I do think that, you know, you can get into a similar state of mind um, running or doing other things. Um, and, and again, we should try as much as possible to bring that mindset into everything we do, to bring it into coding as well. 
Um, but I wouldn't, I, but I would still suggest if you possibly can uh, to find that time just to sit uh, without any other goal in mind. That's great. Um, we're going to have to to wind it up here. I want to I, I want to thank on behalf of all the folks that that um, enjoyed that were able to participate in the live stream. I want to thank you, Dan. Thanks for coming back to Google and 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 sharing um, all of this with us, both both practical advice and a really fundamental um, concept about about mindfulness and how we can achieve it through meditation. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I've I've really enjoyed it. It's really fun to be back talking to to Googlers again and and talking to you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Great. And just, just to recap, the book is called Buddha's Office, The Ancient Art of Waking Up While Working Well. Dan, will you hold up the book for us? Absolutely. There it is. There it is. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. And thank you, everybody who participated. Really appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Take care.